folks, episode nine of the Summit Up podcast for May of 2023. And boy, was May a doozy. We had the uh, initial public draft of 800-171 Revision 3 get published. DOD published a proposed rule to expand eligibility requirements to all defense contractors for participation in the DIB cybersecurity program. I had a long-form one-on-one conversation with Ron Ross in a special edition of this podcast in which we go into great detail of 853, 8171, and the rest of the FISMA series. There was a joint advisory issued by CISA, the Five Eyes, Microsoft, about real-world advanced persistent threat activity from Chinese threat actors against U.S. critical infrastructure and Navy facilities on Guam. Uh, A bunch of things happened, and we go into all of the details related to all of them in this episode. There's going to be lots of links to different resources and media in the show notes that we reference, uh, so please uh, be sure to check those out. And there's lots of stuff to talk about in terms of ongoing comment periods for some of the topics that were discussed in the episode. So if you have things that you'd like to share, be sure to let us know in the comments below. Be sure to like and subscribe. And thanks for listening. Jason, it's May. It's May. Are you sure it's May? It's the end of May. Okay. And, you know, nothing happened this month. So I I kind of lost track of time. We had a long weekend. There was a holiday. And uh, everybody was just kind of hanging out. And there wasn't much that happened. So, <laughs> uh, you know, what could we possibly have to talk about this month? Dude, I feel like it's the exact opposite, actually. I think that you, uh, it was so busy and so many things dropped so concurrently um, that uh, essentially you lost track of time and you went into some time zone warp. Yeah. Yeah. I 100% lost track of time. Yeah. It is. As the kids say, you're living in 2030 and we (laughs) are just back here in in May, May, the month of May and the year of our Lord. This is the podcast for May. Everything that happened in May. So much stuff happened that DOD had to put a post on LinkedIn to remind people that they had issued a proposed rule for the DIBCS program, which we're going to get into. But it's just hard to imagine that when we started this month that DOD would issue a rule for something related to cybersecurity and that so many other things would happen. People wouldn't even know that it had occurred. So... We're going to get into everything that was important in the month and get into it. And we're going to start, as always, with the AB Town Hall for the month of May. So what happened? Well, Jacob, I don't know if you know this or not, but there was a special guest on the AB Town Hall this month. (laughs) Oh, boy. He may not have realized what month of the town hall he was was participating in, (laughs) but he was there. Um, You know, obviously, first and foremost, uh, you know, we want to, being that it is the month of May and it is the month of May, we want to recognize Memorial Day. I'm going to reemphasize it, right? But serious note, you know, recognize Memorial Day and the people that sacrificed, you know, that um, dedicated themselves to service and made the ultimate sacrifice so that you and I could obviously be sitting in front of a camera doing this, something that we have fun doing and, and that we love doing because we're free, right? Yeah, so obviously absolutely. before anything, and, and Matt Travis led off the May, the month of May, Cyber AB Town Hall, um, doing the same thing, you know, paying um, respects to the the people that made the ultimate sacrifice and then followed it with our favorite line that they don't speak authoritatively for the DOD. So anything that comes after this isn't authoritative for the DOD. It's just thoughts and opinions based on uh, our position. Always and so, important, always important to remember. And it is the it is the right disclaimer to say so. Yeah, which does not stop and should not stop everyone from asking questions that the AB can't always answer because we can pick up on those questions here. But yep, it is the AB's town hall, not necessarily the DOD's town hall. So we got to kind of The worst everything. they can say is no, and usually we always yeah. say yes. So it's it's yeah. a good win-win situation. <laughs> yeah. um, so Matt Travis kicked off with, you know, as every single month with the CEO welcome and update segment. And uh, not a lot, and they just basically were streamlining this to the NIST Rev3 Jacob Horn participation in the May Cyber AB Town Hall. <laughs> and <laughs> sorry, it's going to keep coming. Uh, but one of the things that I took from his welcome and update, you know, aside from the um, stuff that we'll cover later on, 
is the growth of the ecosystem, right? We always want to keep in, in line with the growth of the CMMC ecosystem to see whether or not things are progressing in a positive light. And one of the most interesting things that was presented within this the Cyber AB Town Hall for, for May um, was that there are now 42 authorized C3PAOs. That's a lot. And that's a lot. But you know what's even bigger? There is a pool of 400 plus organizations that are waiting to become authorized or that are that's, somewhere on the timeline. That's like 10 times system. more. So that is more so the realistic number that we would all like to see um, take place, you know, to, to, to this be the final, you know, um, settling is at 400, right? We, we, we get to 400. Then there's the uh, dismisses the thoughts of maybe that there's too much work and not enough people to perform the work. And, and, and I think yeah. that's a, a positive uh, takeaway from his update um, coming yeah. in. I mean, it's one of those things. I don't know if there is a amount of um, assessment organizations where people could say there are enough, right? It feels like you can always say there's not enough assessment capacity, that there's mm -hmm. sort of no limit to uh, how quickly you could get one or how many. It, there's various ways of chopping it up. But every month that goes by, right, there's more and more C3PAOs. There's more and more assessment capacity. So there's still not enough, but there's more. And next month there will be more. And the month after that, well, there will be more. And so six months from today, there will be much more capacity than there is currently. And so the sort of argument, which I feel like maybe doesn't have quite the um, bite to it as it did a year ago or two years ago about there aren't enough assessors is sort of slowly, slowly is having the edge taken off of it. So yeah, I mean, pretty soon we're going to be at 50 C3 PAOs. That's, that's quite a bit. That's quite a bit. So it's always good part news of the, to that there's more of them. Part of the process, you know, you got to think about it is that who does the joint surveillance assessments? DIPCAC. Who does the assessments from the C3 PAO organizations? DIPCAC. And that's already a full plate just with the, um, with their normal DIPCAC assessments. Now you're adding these extra ones into it. And so DIPCAC is also in the process of, and, and we both know this, of kind of beefing up their staffing yeah. so that they can perform more of these. And I think as that staffing goes, so does the ball roll. It gets bigger and it gets bigger and it yeah. gains momentum. And I, I feel like we are in this lull, or not lull, because that's a terrible word, um, but we are now in this period of time where we're going to see momentum gradually gain. We're, we're seeing releases of publications. We're seeing more outward communications. And more importantly, we're seeing the production in the ecosystem and the growth of the ecosystem that I think is definitely needed. Well, it's not, I think yeah. we know it's needed. It, and we've talked about this before. If, you know, if there's 400 companies that have expressed interest in becoming C3 PAOs, there, you know, at the very least, that indicates that there are people uh, waiting for the ecosystem to get kicked off with the CMMC sure. program to then throw their hat in the ring to become part of the ecosystem. So you have this growth occurring before CMMC is effective. And then because of all that interest on the sidelines, once CMMC is rolling out, there will be all of this induced demand of those people jumping in to become C3 PAOs once it's up and running, right? So I feel like- I agree. The, to your point, the trend is every month that goes by, there's more capacity in the system. Is it enough currently? No. Will there ever be enough? Who knows? But there's more each time. And more is good because it's more ability to get assessments. It's a better and healthier ecosystem. I feel like I feel like the AB doesn't do enough at the start of their town halls to sort of emphasize that as a key metric um within what's going on i would i would lead with that just on its own slide and say here's the chart of growth of c3 paos over time since we started this a couple of years ago and uh it's going to continue going up we've got a lot of interest everybody should be happy about that i mean it's a good it's a good note to lead off with which is why we lead off with it positive momentum is any momentum and so that go. was the biggest takeaway that i had from the ceo welcome and update and then that segued quickly into the keiko corner where Kyle Gingrich comes on screen and she had just a few things and these all kind of apply. Well, some of these apply to you. Some of these don't apply to you. So just, you know, make sure you take <laughs> notes, buddy. Um, the Keiko corner. So like one, first and foremost, if you tested for the CCA or the CCP, obviously there's suitability requirements that come along with that, that you have to achieve before you participate in a CMMC assessment. And so um, 
if you tested on or before May 15th um, and have not applied for suitability, um, she has said that the uh, Keiko will uh, peg you with messages probably once a month until you either respond or complete your process. One of the credentialed, uh, another topic is another one of the credential roles that we talked about a couple episodes ago, um, the CMMC lead assessor, which is probably a very vital part of this entire Definitely ecosystem. Definitely important. Um, that program has been put on hold pending rulemaking. So the completion of rulemaking will then establish the, the lead assessor. So that'll be a little interesting tidbit that we need to uh, keep track of uh, to see kind of how that plays into the factor of when this thing goes live, rulemaking's yeah. done, how assessments are being completed. And I wonder and how much of a I wonder how much of a difference there will be between CCA training and lead assessor training, if there is even much of a delta at all, or if it's just a designation. So, I mean, we'll have to wait and see what the detail is in the rule, but you have to imagine if lead assessor is a designation and you have to have CCA to be a lead assessor, is there some sort of hidden Kung Fu that we don't know about that you would get trained on that, you know, isn't covered under CCA or is it just some sort of programmatic designation where, uh, you know, you know, based off what's uh, in the rule for eligibility or suitability or whatever right. it happens to be. My gut says that there probably isn't a bunch of new material that people are going to have to study and, a you know, another book that you're going to have to read and another test that you'll have to take. I feel like it's going to be mostly programmatic because that seems to be the, uh, the nature of the CMMC rule itself. So I don't think that that, um, that process being put on hold is an indicator that there's like a bunch of extra material that people are going to have to, uh, have to learn. So my thoughts on it are that, uh, and they can uh, consistently get drawn to, I think that the lead assessor training is going to focus more on like the managerial aspects yeah. of it, right? Cause you're acting as a manager. So just like you said, programmatic stuff, um, you know, like the type of within the cap, you know, there's certain roles and responsibilities that the lead assessor must carry out. There's certain documentation they must deliver. So I bet that it has something to do with that, but obviously we're not, you know, privy to that information. Um, and then final note from the Keiko corner, please make sure you take notes in the month of June. Okay. That's next that's, month. That's next month. So um, all provisional assessors, and this is a final reminder directly for you and the two other people that probably <laughs> yeah, have. Yeah, me and this. both other people that haven't done it uh, yet. All provisional assessors, um, so anybody with a provisional tag in front of their name or, or their credential right now, have until June 19th, that deadline was extended last month as we covered, to complete their CCP course and, and, and you know certification process. And you, Jacob, have until August the 16th <laughs> to complete do that. your cca process okay, do buddy? <laughs> every listen for the past two months we've talked about this deadline yep. for the past two months i see you write down on your notepad like it's right here like a, yeah, it's like an action <laughs> item so yeah well like i said it, it was a good thing that nothing happened in the month of may this month uh and so right. i had lots of time uh to study and get ready but yeah no nope, we'll uh got it on my note got it on my list here got it on my that, program and that essentially wrapped up the Keiko Corner. And then uh, there is some stuff that was touched on in Matt Travis's um, welcome and update that I definitely want you to dig deeper in on. And that's Dave McEwen, uh, the CMMC rulemaking update. Um, Matt Travis provided a slide, had some quotes from Dave McEwen, um, you know, essentially related to the, SM, uh, to the CMMC program and rulemaking process. And I want to know exactly, you know, what was said on those slides and what, it, what exactly does it mean? Yeah, so uh, so Matt had a slide that had um, a statement from Dave McEwen, and Dave was giving a presentation um, in, earlier in May uh, at mm -hmm. some event in D.C. Uh, mm -hmm. John Sherman, also the DOD CIO, gave a presentation at the Potomac Officers Club in D.C., mm -hmm. which, you know, I'm glad they're giving presentations, but man, it would be really nice if we gave those presentations um, at events that people had access to. Uh, there's a lot of, this is just my personal observation, there's a lot of rhetoric about making sure that everybody, even people outside of the Beltway, are kept up to speed on what's going on. And when you give presentations at events that are only in the Beltway and only in person, Kind of frustrating, kind of frustrating, but there were some reporters who picked up on the quotes, so we at least know sort of what was said. And Dave McEwen said, uh, the Pentagon is very focused on DIB cybersecurity. We continue to work on the CMMC rule. It's progressing well inside of the building, the Pentagon, and we're targeting late fall of next year 
being 2024, so that we can start to put it into contracts. So okay. this is the first time, I think, that the DoD has said a time frame in quite some time. Because this time last year, in May of 2022, everywhere the DoD went, and anybody from the Pentagon that was talking about this would tell you, we're expecting to publish the rule in March of 2023, and we expect it to go into contracts in summer of 2023. We want and expect an interim final rule. And this wasn't just like somebody said it in passing, and it sort of went viral in the community. This is what they testified to Congress, like in hearings sure. in front of the Armed Services Committees, Kelly Flet Dr. Kelly Fletcher, John Sherman, everybody from this team was like, that's the plan, that's what we're gonna do. In the year since, obviously, um, you know, John Sherman and company have said, uh, it's taking us longer than we want. This was not the plan, but we're trying to measure twice and cut once. We don't wanna have to go back and do it again. We just wanna get it right the first time, which is probably the right way to do it. You know, the extra time is never ideal, but that's just the way it rolls out. And now as we draw closer, like I said, John Sherman earlier in the month said, we're sending it to SBA. Dave McEwen, his deputy said, we're sending it to SBA. We plan on being able to put it into contracts in fall of next year. So what does that mean? Um, we've put out some content in the past. We've talked about this several times. There are basically two scenarios that the CMMC rule can take. It can be an interim final rule. It can be a proposed rule. We know that the DOD wants an interim final rule, but for whatever reason, everybody seems to have converged on the idea and reached the consensus that it will be a proposed rule. We don't know okay. for sure if that's true, but just for the sake of simplicity, we will use the proposed rule scenario. And the proposed rule scenario lines up with exactly what Dave is talking about. If they send the rule to the Small Business Administration, which they're currently doing, and then once the Small Business Administration is done looking at, they send it over to OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, that would be the regulatory review process, the standard rulemaking process. The nice part about them deciding to send the rule to SBA before they send it to OMB is it is um, an extra set of eyes. It is an sure. extra concurrence. It is concurrence from the small business administration that the rule is good to go so that when it goes now, up is to this, OMB. Is this typical? Is it typical for rules to be not filtered that I know through of. the SBA? Usually, yeah, usually um, SBA is involved like everybody else once it's out for publication, as far as sure. I know. Not an expert in that particular um, set of DOD rules in terms of it going to SBA first or second. Um, you know, DOD ultimately just doesn't do as much rulemaking as other federal agencies, and it does very, very little rulemaking that directly affects the public because that's just not what DOD does. This isn't, uh, you know, HHS, this isn't IRS, this isn't EPA, this isn't FAA, right? These aren't agencies that are issuing rules and regulations that directly impact the public. Um, and so there just isn't a lot of precedent for, um, for how that process works. Really, most of the rules that DOD has issued that interface with the public are the DFARS cybersecurity <laughs> rules, right? But e either way, Going to SBA first is a good thing, but it takes more time, and that's a bad thing because people. Well, would go, this be time that's normally occupied by OMB and OIRA in their review process? Um, like, obviously, they have to take in the considerations in, in that part. So, would that be something that normally they would do? So, you know, yeah, obviously, I mean, you're lessening you could, yeah. the load on them. Yeah, I would think so. I would think that by having SBA look at it first, it sort of front loads the extra review time that um, OIRA would use when they're looking at it, which is sure. which is good. It In terms of when, how it shakes out, we won't know until the process is done. You know, Would it have gone faster if they sent it to OMB and then to SBA versus SBA first? Hard to know, um, but I don't disagree with the plan. I think it's fine. I think it's probably the right call. And you know, it goes to show that by the time the rule is published, there has already been a lot of review and a lot of updating and a lot of editing and a lot of regulatory inertia by the time we get to the public comment period. And that's what we've talked about before. The irony of rulemaking is that 
over time, they don't want to, the government doesn't want to release unfinished rules because then the public doesn't know exactly what they're commenting on. But in order to fix that problem, the rule has to be done before you submit it for public comment, which undermines the leverage that public comments have over changing the rule, right? So it's this weird thing. Either way, as far as the timeline goes, we're sending it to SBA, then to OMB. Once OMB gets done looking at it, then it would be published in the Federal Register. So if they publish that rule in the Federal Register, let's say in August, so sometime this summer, sometime between June sure. and September, call it August, and it's a proposed rule, on average, the amount of time it takes for a DOD proposed rule to be published as a final rule and therefore being effective and getting put into contracts is 333 days, right? Yep. And so uh, we've got uh, a year-ish of time from the time it's published until the time that it's finalized and the phased rollout starts where it starts to get inserted into chunks of contracts at a time. If you plot this out on a calendar, a published rule in August gives us a final rule in Q4 of 2024, which is exactly what Dave McEwen has said. So. Um, so what DOD is currently saying lines up with that proposed rule scenario. We've just slid it from March to uh, from March of this of this year to Q4 of 2024 due to all this extra review time, which for all intents and purposes is perfectly justifiable, which, you know, this isn't really that complicated of a, of an idea to comprehend, right? They got to publish mm -hmm. the rule. Everybody's going to submit their comments. DOD has got to look at those comments and respond to them when they respond to them in a final rule. That's the final rule. And we're off to the races. CMMC starts to roll out. CMMC assessments are authorized. C3PAOs can do their thing. Like we talked about earlier, hopefully a bunch of these C3PO's that are on the sidelines waiting, throw their hat in the ring. And then, you know, the whole thing just catapults from there. The X factor here, however, is the other big event that happened in May, which is the revision to 800 -171. And this gets to the idea that CMMC is a program that assesses the requirements in 800 -171. The CMMC sure. rule is the rule that is formalizing and codifying the tenets of that program, not the requirements that the program assesses. DOD contractors have to implement the requirements in 800 -171 according to DFAR 7012, a contract clause that has existed since 2013 that we know in its current form since 2016, itself the output of its own rulemaking process that has been done for years now. So this causes um, a lot of questions to come up in the town hall because you are going to update the requirements that CMMC is going to assess. So when CMMC says go get an assessment, which set of requirements are you going to be assessed against? So now if we imagine that timeline, you've got summer of 2023 and then a long waiting period until you get to Q4 of 2024. NIST published the initial draft of 171 Rev 3 this month, and they expect in their official statement as of the time of this recording to be Q4 of 2024 when we'll get the final mm -hmm. uh, version of 800 -171 Rev 3. Well, if you get the final requirements revised in Q1 of 2024 and you get the final rule for CMMC in Q4 of 2024, the big question is, the CMMC rule is occurring after the new requirements are finalized. Six, nine, maybe 12 months after the requirements are finalized. So which set of requirements is everyone going to be assessed against? Um, on paper, right, you will be assessed against 800 -171 revision 3 because DFAR 7012 says you have to implement the version of 800-171 that is in effect at the time of your solicitation, right? right? And so this was a question that we put up on LinkedIn and that Bob Metzger, friend of the show, friend of CS2, uh, chimed in on. 
obviously, if there is a big delta of requirements that are added to revision three, and DFAR 7012 says you just have to implement them, is everybody going to have to implement them instantaneously? Or will there be some amount of grace period in which you have to stay on Rev 2 and work towards Rev 3? And doing so is something known as a class deviation. Now, we'll probably have to have Bob on to explain the details of a class deviation. I'm not a lawyer. Neither of us are lawyers. This is not legal advice, not a class deviation expert. All I know is that DFAR 7012 was created in 2013, and it specified a bunch of requirements. It was updated in 2016 and specified a delta of requirements in 800-171 different from the original requirements in 2013. And they issued a class deviation that said you have a year to implement sure. those requirements. So that's exactly what everybody's talking about now. And probably, according to Bob Metzger and common sense, probably what they would do <clears throat> for 800-171 Rev 3. 171 Rev 3 comes out. The DOD says, hey, here's a class deviation holding that part of DFAR 712. You have a year to implement the changes. And then we're going to just assume everybody has Rev 3 in place. There's no problem with that. However, if the CMMC rule is a year after the 171 Rev 3 is finalized and the class deviation for 171 Rev 3 is a year long, then everyone will still be assessed against 800 171 Rev 3. Now, the, the crazy okay. part here, right? The crazy part here is that NIST has hinted that they don't want to wait until Q1 of 2024. They want to go as fast as possible. They want the revision to be good. They want it to be technically correct. They want it to be implementable. They want it to be better. And they want to go quickly. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. NIST, as a government agency, can take all the time they want, right? But they have said, we want to go fast. So we're going to talk about the very long conversation that we had with Ron on the special edition of the podcast. And he said in that podcast, Q1 of 2024 is the absolute latest that we can expect the final version of Revision 3 to come out. They would ideally like it to be done this year, 2023. So let's just assume for a moment that they can do it, right? All right. And before you before you dive into that, yeah, let's take everything because that's that that's a huge, it's a very vital lump of information that you just, you know, it sure out. is. So I want to take that information. I want to sum it up for the people at home. Ding 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 ding. Word of the day. Nice. I've been trying. Nice. To can we? Hey, editor Dusty, can we get a counter every time we use the phrase "sum it up"? Dude, it's I've been waiting nine full episodes to figure out when I can just plug this in there. <laughs> he okay? said it. He said it. <clears throat> All right. So up until the month of May, we were waiting for the DOD to submit a rule to OMB. That's what we were being told, waiting for it to be, go over to OMB. Yes or no? That's right. Leave the Pentagon, so, go to OMB. And that review process, based on all the research that you've done, is 333 days, right? Or not 333 days. From the process that's being submitted to it going final is usually a 333 day process, correct? From the time it's published. So it's gotta published. go from it's gotta go from the agency to OMB. OMB sure. has to review it. Once they're done okay. reviewing it, it gets published. Typically from the time it is submitted for review to the time it's published is about sixty-six calendar days. From the time okay. it's published until the time it's final is about a year. Okay. So now, instead of waiting for it to go to OMB, we are still waiting for DOD to submit it to the SBA for review and then take a next SBA, step to OMB for review. Yeah. Small Business Administration gives it their blessing. Then it sure. goes to OMB, according to what we can tell from kind of open-ended statements by DOD. It might already be with SBA. It might be a collaborative effort between DOD and SBA. As far as I can tell, this is not a formal part of the standard rulemaking approach. They're just doing it to be better at the process. So yeah, it's got to go to SBA, then to OMB, then to publication, and then to final, right? Okay. If it's, and yep. Dave McEwen has said in public that that process you just described, the four-step process that you just described 12 microseconds ago, needs to complete by quarter four, 2024. He intends for it to complete. Yeah, yeah. according to the way that that process has to work, that it should be done by Q4 of 2024, at which point 
CMMC would be final and it could start going into contracts in, a, we assume, based off what we've heard, a phased rollout process. So DOD would sure. probably pick the first batch of contracts that are going out or up for uh, renewal, and then they would insert it into there, and then the next batch and the next batch until over the course of several years, it's in all DOD contracts. And because DFAR 7021 is a validation of compre- or the um, Im- implementation of 7012 requirements, and 7012 states that the current version of NIST 800171 is the baseline that needs to be established with 171 Rev 3 having a timeline of Q1 2024 based on Ron Ross conversation that the active NIST 800171 requirements or revision could be Rev 3 at that time unless a class deviation is awarded or has issued has or whatever the, yeah, whatever the verb is I'm not done. sure what it yeah and that's basically a micro change or a deviation to the baseline mm-hmm. of what's going to happen. And so that that's one of those things that's still outli- outlying and is dependent. Yeah. So is let's say, that... let's, let's forget about, forget about CMMC for a second, right? Let's just say we live in the world where you have just DFAR 7012 and sure. everybody's self attesting their way to better security. Sure. So DFAR 712 says all DOD contractors have to implement the version of 800-171 in effect at the time of their contract solicitation. And now right. along comes a big revision to your 800-171 requirements. And there's a bunch of new stuff that you have to do, like 27 new controls and a bunch of other stuff that you have to do. So the revision goes final and DFAR 712 now points to all that new stuff. Do you have any grace period between yesterday and today when NIST publishes the update to implement that Delta? Or do you just have to have done it before the requirements are final? Like, do you just have to guess that the draft will be the final version? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Do you just have to do it within a matter of a few hours the day that it's published? That doesn't make any sense. There has to be some sort of a buffer for how much time you have to implement these delta of requirements. In the past, when we updated DFAR 7012 in 2016, compared to the 2013 version, a class deviation was issued and we got a year of time, okay. which is why the rule for 7012 was updated in 2016. Everybody's deadline to be compliant with 800-171 was 2017, right? Because the class deviation said you've got all this extra time. So everybody says, we're gonna update 171 Rev 3 when do I have to implement it? Everybody assumes that there's going to be a class deviation issued, which makes total sense. But when you put that into the CMMC rule timeline, if 171 Rev 3 is final in Q1 of 2024, and you get in a, a year to implement the Delta, and CMMC is supposed to start showing him contracts at the end of 2024, it won't matter if you get a class deviation of a year, you probably will still be assessed against 800-171 Rev 3. Is the current way that it looks like it will play out? We don't know the details of a class deviation. We don't even know if DOD is going to issue one. They probably will. But, you know, it's just one of those things. It's very important to pay attention to what's going on with Rev 3 because most people will probably get assessed against that standard instead of Rev 2. But what about an entire ecosystem of trained personnel and training content that is centered around revision two? Yeah, well, um, you know, I don't, um, I don't run the decisions for training content for mm-hmm. DOD. But if I did, I would say don't train just on specific versions of eight hundred one seventy one. Train on the eight hundred fifty three controls that are used to derive versions of 800-171 because then it doesn't matter what bits and pieces of the 853 controls are taken to form 800-171. You already know all of that stuff. So, um, you know, there's gotta be some time, obviously, because we're not not gonna train everybody on 853. That's just not the approach they're gonna take. So there's gotta be some time to update the training materials and update the training and get everybody up to snuff. How long should that take? Maybe a year? Let's assume it's a year. Okay. Right. 800 So if you get a class deviation for a year, then you have it, but then you still have to train people up. 
Don't sure. So you got a class deviation. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense. Let's say it's a year. A year feels reasonable, right? Sure. Um, so uh, let's say it's a year. DoD says, hey, everybody with DFAR 7012, you're on Rev 2. You got a year to implement the Delta. Hey, everybody in the CMMC ecosystem, AB, we got to update this training. We got to train everybody on the Delta. Um, everybody has a year. Okay. Yeah. So Q1 2024 rolls around. Everybody starts their work in a year. A year goes by, and guess what? The CMMC rule is final, and it starts showing up in contracts. No problem, right? Is so there's still a lot of a lot of pieces of the puzzle that have to fall to figure out what yeah. exactly revision of 800-171 that people are going to have to adhere to. Based yeah, like off we of need to know what is or... DOD's plan for a class sure. deviation. What is their plan for how much time they're going to give everybody? Everybody, based off of my very unscientific LinkedIn poll, feels like it should be about a year. That's mm -hmm. pretty much what they did back in 2016. You know, that feels like what everybody sort of thinks is the correct answer. Um, okay. And then we've got to get everybody trained on the new material. You got to get everybody on the Delta training. Probably about a year sounds about right. The point is, is that, like we've said before, a year sounds like a really long time unless you are staring down needing an assessment against requirements that you haven't implemented yet because it takes a year to 18 months for a lot of companies to implement the current version of 800-171 from start to finish. Now right. we're going to add the, the, the Rev3 Delta on top of that. So if you haven't started your implementation yet or really done a lot of 800-170 run Rev2, then in a year of time between Q4 of this year and Q4 of next year is not a lot of time. I mean, it's a, it's a whole year, but it's not a lot of time for companies that are like waiting on the CMMC rule to start their implementation, which you can imagine if it takes 12 to 18 months, add three to six months for the Delta of 171 Rev 3. So take that block of time and then stick it at the start of the CMMC rollout in Q4 of 2024. If you don't start your implementation of 800-171 Rev 2 with the Rev 3 Delta until the CMMC rule is published, you wouldn't be ready for over a year and a half to get your assessment, right? Yeah. And so there's not enough assessors. And so everybody's going to be waiting for an assessment. And so you probably won't have any negative consequences, maybe. Sure. Right. But a lot of companies want to get their assessment as soon as they're ready to go. They just want to get it out of the way and they want to, you know, check the box and do their thing. And it's totally understandable. That's what people should do. But a lot of companies don't realize how long it takes to get through that implementation time. So when you hear stuff like class deviation, when you hear about these timelines, just realize that the biggest timeline of them all is the timeline for starting implementation to being assessment ready. Okay. And so, Obviously, you know, we, what spun that, that conversation that we just had was your conversation with Ron Ross and your conversation about NIST 800-171 Rev 3 from the town hall. And so I am very, very eager to hear your thoughts on the conversation with Ron Ross. Yeah. So um, we'll have the link to uh, the convo with Ron. Uh, it was very interesting because... yeah. Um, you know, Ron Ross has been at NIST for like 30 years. And sure. if you read FIPS 199, if you read FIPS 200, if you read 853, if you read 800 171, 800 160, if you read any of these major NIST publications, he wrote them, right? He and the teams that he leads wrote these documents and they've got his fingerprints all over them. So he's the guy to talk to about what's going on with the standards. And if it wasn't him, it was the people that came up under him who, you know, are the the heirs to to all of these standards at NIST. And so, uh, you know, it was fascinating to talk to this guy. It was effectively, the way that I would describe the conversation is it's roughly split into thirds. So the first third of the conversation is really like, who is Ron Ross? Where did he come from? How did he end up doing this? What's the origin story? And then how did we end up in this situation with FISMA triggering all of this cybersecurity control and standardization work back in the early 2000s. The second, the sort of middle third of the conversation 
is really focused on those FISMA documents, FIPS 199, FIPS 200, 853, what they are, why they're designed the way that they are, what are they supposed to do? And specifically, I spent probably 45 minutes talking to him about this because the case that I have made since CS2 Tampa in March of 2022 was that if 800-171 is derived directly from 853, then the way that 853 has evolved and changed over time will necessarily cause 800-171 to be limited or enabled at different things. So if there was material that used to be in 853 and then it was taken out, when you derive 171 from 853, you can't get that material in 800 So when people ask about things like examples, when they ask about things like better context around the controls, when they ask about things about how are the controls related, when they ask about things about how does this work from a technical versus a managerial perspective, when they ask sure. about all this stuff, if you go back into old versions of 853, they used to have stuff like that in there and then they took it out. So it was a very long part of the conversation where I was like, why did you take that out? What was the reason why it used to be in 53 and now is no longer in 53? Ultimately sort of culminating in the question of, can we bring it back? Because that's the kind of stuff that would be very useful for people dealing with 800 And then the sort of third last part of the conversation um, is us talking about 800-171 specifically, sort of Ron's perspective about why and how it came together, and then sort of how it has played out over the last several years. And then we get into some specific um, uh, details about things like the formatting changes that we see in the 171 R3 draft, which we're going to get into in some details here in a minute. Why did they really sort of change um, 800 171 formatting compared to the way that it's been formatted for several years now. And where is 800 171 going in the future? So it's a long conversation, but uh, you know, we've talked about this before. <clears throat> um, every time a NIST publication is revised, every time a new standard comes out, every time a rule is issued, there is more stuff that you have to know in order to put that new stuff in context, right? Okay. So uh, when 171R3 draft comes out, you have to know about the CUI program. You have to know about the CMMC program. You have to know about previous versions of 171. You have to know about 853. You have to know about previous versions of 853. You have to know where 853 fits in context of the FISMA series. You have to know why it was uh, designed as a result of FISMA in the first place. And what context was it designed to fit into that ultimately influences why 800 feels so weird for a company that's trying to start from scratch because it's derived from a set of controls that was designed to fit into an agency that already has stuff up and running. So there's this sort of okay. fundamental tension behind what's going on. So it's a long conversation, but I think it's worth everybody's time because you know, I was even talking to Ron about this on the sh- on the show. By the time we get to talking about 800-171, that last hour to hour and a half, we are saying things, we're using vocabulary from 853, like an overlay or an enhancement or a base control or a tailoring or this or that. And if you just tune in to that part of the conversation, you're going to go, what, is this, what does it mean? Like, what are you talking about? So I think it's worth everybody's time to listen to what Ron is saying throughout the conversation, okay. because by the time 171 Rev 3 final comes out, and we hopefully get to have Ron back on the show, we can go a lot faster, right? We can say like, hey, what's going on? But there's just all of this background context that you have to cover. And it's very difficult to do. If somebody wanted to go read all of that stuff, it would take you a really, really long time. So three and a half hours feels like a lot of stuff to listen to, but it's a lot faster than having to try and read it and understand it. Um, on your own. So I think people should give it a listen. If not, we split it up by timestamps and Ron and I don't really talk about anything for longer than five minutes at a time. So you can skip around and find the parts that you find the most interesting. That's um, so every, every time 
when we talk about doing long form, you know, type of content, people are like, yeah, but I just don't have the time or whatever it may be. And it's intended for you to go to it and come back or go to the things that interest you and be drawn in. Right. And so the time timestamps is what I constantly reference people to. I'm like, you need to use the timestamps, go to the stuff that you like first, garner your interest. And then, you know, we hope that you like it all, but let's be realistic. Some people yeah. come to our videos to see certain topics or of course, certain things yeah, of course. and can do without things that they're familiar with. I mean, um, so I, if you I mean, had timestamps are, time are helpful for me because I go back to videos and stuff all the time and I got to scroll to one specific part. And so, yeah, definitely check yeah. out the timestamps. They take a long time to put together. But um, but yeah, I think that the overall conversation is very helpful for folks. too. If you have three bits of. So let's say that I'm a uh, organization in the div. I run an organization in the div and I'm not quite familiar with NIST publications and, and things like that. And this new revisions come out. If you had three recommendations for me to, uh, to, to follow through on, what would they be? <clears throat> um, let's see. The first thing that I would tell people about if you didn't have a lot of background in NIST publications and you're trying to understand what's going on with Rev3, go to the 800-171-R3 website and mm -hmm. read the FAQ document that got sure. published. I would also go to the document that NIST published of their summary of pre-draft public comments. And the reason why I think those documents are very helpful for people that are not super familiar with what's going on with this document or with NIST publications in general is it does a very good job of explaining what NIST is not responsible for, right? Sure. Uh, what is out of scope for the NIST documents and therefore the limits of what 800-171 um, is supposed to represent. Outside of that, I would say that people should give 800-171 Rev3 draft an actual read. And if, as you're reading it, you're like, I don't understand this, or I don't understand this, or this doesn't make any sense, write it down and submit it as a public comment. NIST takes public comments extremely seriously. And a theme that came up over and over again in my conversation with Ron is that they read these comments and they are very open to changing the look and feel and format of the standards and the controls doesn't mean that they're changing the substance of what you have to do. They're more than open to the idea of experimenting with different things as evinced by a lot of the conversation where I bring up old things that they used to try and do to make it easier to understand. Here's the thing that uh, we were, I was actually talking about with uh, Allison Giddens, friend of the show, a famous CS2 presenter. One of the themes that comes up in the conversation with Ron is that a lot of the public comments that they have that have influenced and shaped 853 over the years come from an audience that is familiar with 853. A lot of the structure and substance of 800 is influenced by 853 directly. And so it isn't until they start to get public comments on 800 that we can expand the aperture of what 171 needs to include in order to have it make more sense. Because when the original 800-171 came about, nobody really participated in that conversation because the threat of CMMC wasn't really hanging over everybody's head. And the same went for revision one and the same went for revision two. And it wasn't until we got to revision three now where we've sort of reached this critical mass of people outside of that 853 environment are looking at and commenting on these NIST controls. Now, I really hate to call it belly aching because, you know, like that is a negative term, but we'll use belly aching. Um, do you feel like that the um, belly aching and things like that would be subsided if people participate, participate in the public comment period? Um, well, I guess it depends, right? It depends on where the criticisms are coming from. And I'll give Ron Ross credit. You know, he basically opens the conversation with the idea that they take praise and criticism in stride and they mm -hmm. try to look at the value uh, of where it's coming from inherently rather than taking it personally so all forms of inputs are valuable not just it's good or it's bad and i don't like it now what i will say though the reason why it's important to read the faq and the pre-draft public comment summary from nist is if the criticisms of the 800-171 standard are that it's too expensive, right? Mm -hmm. That's not something that NIST has any control over. That is something that the agency and their contractors have to deal with, right? NIST's job sure. 
is not to constrain or tailor the set of security controls because it is uh, too expensive for a 50 person company to be able to implement. Their job is to come up with the minimum acceptable standard to uh, meet the requirements of FISMA for federal information. And so what we talk about at length in our conversation is when the data goes out of the government and into the supply chain, it doesn't suddenly lose its FISMA obligations to be protected. So that control baseline follows that data outside of the government. But as it gets into smaller and smaller organizations, it necessarily gets more and more expensive and burdensome because they are less and less resourced. But that doesn't mean that NIST can tailor 853 to fit a 50 person company and not be uh, expensive or burdensome or disruptive or impactful or so on and so forth. And so we've got this weird balance where if you want them to tailor the baseline, you got to look at where the criticisms are based out of, right? Which I would encourage people to listen to that conversation because this is a this is a delicate topic, man. I mean, this is a this is a thing, and this is one of the this is one of the harder questions I think that I asked Ron in the conversation was philosophically. I get it. Oh, when right? you get philosophical, it gets deep. I mean, but here's here's a question that everybody should ponder, right? We have to have a minimum baseline of controls to protect this information. I think everybody agrees with that. And sure. NIST is responsible for making a standard that makes sense in you know, uh, in, in a vacuum, essentially, sure. sort of in a in in this in this standard sort of federal environment. And then once the data flows into the supply chain and flows into smaller and smaller organizations, then that standard gets more and more regressive in terms of the fact that it it starts to outpace the size and capability of these organizations to deal with it. Now, NIST maintains that because of the need to continue to protect the data, they can't tailor that baseline to just fit small businesses because then they, they don't have the level of protection or assurance that the government needs and wants. But if 80, 85% of the companies that have the information are going to be unable to meet the standard, then does that question the standard in the first place, right? Now, okay. that isn't really a, a problem that NIST can solve, right? Because if they come up with a, how many controls would they need to remove for it to suddenly be acceptable for a 50 person company, right? 10 controls, half of the controls, 90% of the controls, there's no way for them to be able to tailor it in a meaningful way so as a result, all they can do is create the standard and then queue it up for the agencies. And if the agencies decide that they need to flow this information in the supply chain, the agencies have to figure out what the solution is going to be to meet that gap between the standard and small businesses. Okay. To quickly wrap up this topic, I have a, I have a question for you. Like, And it's not like a, a, a deep thought question. Or maybe it is. Well, it we'll see about with, that. It has to do with marriage. So it, it quite possibly could be. <laughs> Do you feel like, and it, just you know, it, listen to you talk. Do you feel like the public comment period is essentially um, the NIST publications version of like at a wedding when they say "speak now or forever hold your peace"? Um, I Except feel for like forever hold your peace means until the next revision. Uh, I feel like it is. Um, <clears throat> no, no. I think the no? NIST comment period is not like that. I think that the federal rulemaking comment period is like that. Okay. I think that NIST. Um, NIST takes comments outside of comment periods. I mean, NIST takes comments on a rolling basis. Um, right. uh, everybody at NIST that I've ever sent a message to is easy to get a hold of, right? Um, and so they, they, I a distinctly different vibe from NIST regarding their comment process and how they take comments on and what those comments eventually do to changes to the publications than I do from the rulemaking rule process yeah. comments where the rulemaking process, because by the time the rule is published and the public is commenting on it, the rule is pretty much done. The federal mm -hmm. rulemaking process is very dismissive of public comments, right? And this is a thing that has been studied by academics who have studied the rulemaking process where they've said, there is not a lot of evidence that public comments on published rules 
have a lot of leverage or ever actually really change the substance of the rule because by the time it's published, it's gone through OMB and OIRA and the agency and SBA and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. So by the time you get to the end of that process, you don't have a lot of ability to change the rule. It's pretty much done at that point. It is not like that when you get to the NIST process. NIST is publishing their draft a year before they think that they're going to publish their final one. They're planning on publishing a different draft. They want the comments. They're doing podcasts. They're doing this. They're doing two comment periods, right? Yeah. I mean, so at the time of this recording, NIST is supposed to give a webinar on June 6th. And um, that's when they're supposed to. uh, That's That's next next month. month. That's next month. But currently, this is June. No, currently this is May. It's May. There he goes. Man, we've geez. lost him again. Man, I did it again. We've, we've lost him again. <laughs> so yeah. So uh, and June sixth, NIST is supposed to have a webinar, right? Now, the reason why I say NIST wants to go faster is because based off of talking to Ron and based off of what everybody's hearing, what's happening out there, um, I would imagine that there, and we're probably going to talk about this on the podcast for June, the month of June podcast. I have a feeling that NIST is going to come out at that webinar and they're going to say, not only are we going to go faster, but we're going to publish 800-171A as soon as possible. This was something Mm -hmm. that Ron and I talked about on the podcast. I was like, listen, man, you can't publish the set of requirements and then publish the assessment guide for those requirements afterwards. People are not engineers. They just don't have that set up in their environment to be able to look at the requirements And then decompose to what the verification procedures would be. Just do them at the same time. And he agrees. He agrees. Mm -hmm. He does not like the process of going requirements draft, requirements final, verification procedures draft, verification procedures final. And so my hunch is, is that they're going to do both at the same time or close to the same time, which gets back to this idea of if we get 171 and 171A Rev3 at the end of 2023, beginning of 2024, it's even more of an indicator that by the time we get to the end of 2024 and into 2025, that CMMC assessments would be assessing 800-171 Rev3, right? Because we all know, listeners to this podcast should know, 800-171 is great, but the part that really matters is 800-171A. We don't have that yet. NIST knows that. I feel like they're going to drop a bombshell on everybody in June, the month of June, a week from That's this recording, which we're recording nice. in May. So one of the things that I asked Ron in the, the podcast that I found so interesting was in this long line of things that used to be in 853 that were then taken out, which I feel like would be very helpful for NIST to include in at least 800 were the idea of priority codes or P codes. And you can go back to 853 Rev 4, 853 Rev 3, if anybody's looking for something to do uh, this weekend. And you can see that all of the 853 controls have these codes, P0, P1, P2, P3. And the description of a priority code is, it's supposed to indicate at a high level the sequence in which a control is supposed to be implemented. P1 should probably go first, P2 should probably go second, P3 should probably go third. P0s can go whenever you want to. And this is a technology neutral way of somewhat structuring the catalog of controls, which I think is something that uh, was incorrect to get rid of. And when I asked them about what was the philosophy behind, because they weren't there in the original versions of 853, I was like, why did you create them? And then why did you get rid of them? Well, back in the day, uh, the late, and great Alan Power, the founder of Sands Institute, used to fight with Ron. They used to get into these epic wizard battles. And he said, listen, 853 is great, but there's no prioritization in it. It's a dictionary. It's a catalog. It's a toolbox. You need to prioritize it. And there's too many of them. Okay. And they would go back and forth and fight all the time. So finally, after <clears> years <throat> of this, Alan Power invented the Sands Top 20, which then became the CIS top 20, like the CIS controls. And so it's Ron's fault (laughs) because they used to get in this fight and he was like, no, it's supposed to be this neutral catalog of controls from which you select and implement. And then it's up to you to decide uh, which order in 
that you should implement them, which is an understandable position. Alan Power said, nope, that's not the way that I think it should be done. And so these uh, different frameworks that exist out there in the ecosystem can sort of be traced back to this series of debates that Alan and Ron had over time. I wish they would have been recorded or written down or something, because I'm sure that they were probably um, very insightful. But I thought that was very interesting. And Anyways, that, folks, it, is the seven degrees to Ron Ross. Yeah, I mean, it's like I say in the podcast, there's not a lot of stuff <clears throat> that uh, in the security world that can't be traced back to what was going on, um, you know, in the 80s and 90s in, you know, the, the MITRE, NSA, NIST, DOD world of security research. Uh, and he was the guy that was there for all of it. Anyways, let's talk about 800-171 Rev 3 initial public draft. So, um, where to start? Well, let's let's do this. Uh, people have heard me talk about it several times. I've got some sort of high level takeaways. What do you think? What do you think of of it? Just at a high level, with the caveat, obviously, this is a draft, right? This is a draft. It is not the final version. The final version will probably look a lot like this. But what do you think, man? What do you think of the formatting? What do you think about the structure? What do you, like? What's your take on it? Well, what I think is, is that one of the benefits of having an unrehearsed show is being put on the spot like this and having to answer questions from Jacob Horn about the, uh, about the revision. I, so when it came out, um, from NDIA, I, you know, did a, a LinkedIn live with a few of our colleagues, um, Shout our out comrades, to the Cooey center of excellence discord, our, our Cooey comrades and, uh, gave my initial gut reactions. And I can say that now that I've had more time to digest it and more time to read it, my initial gut reactions and my knee-jerk reactions to the document itself haven't wavered at all. Um, I really, really, really think that this was well-written and they took their time um, to make it more ingestible for all forms, all walks of life. Is there still going to be confusion? Sure. But I think that there's going to be a lot less confusion based on the way that it was written. So that's my initial reaction. Second is one that we share together which is that I like that it now resembles 853 <clears throat> as somebody that cut their teeth in 853 land. Um, I, I feel like that it's now much easier for me to interpret it and me to relate it back or map it to controls based on the way that it's written. And I really, really like the addition of ODPs. I know them as ODVs um, from yeah. my time you know, with the government whatever change the one letter as long as it serves the same purpose um but realistically i think that there was a lot of confusion and as somebody that served as a consultant prior to coming to work for summit seven um a lot of the questions that i answered that said was you know had to do with um defining frequencies and things like that well what's a good frequency right and you would always point to industry best practices now it's a dictated value that that, that the organization has to carry out so yeah well let's Let's talk about that. So I think okay. that uh, I agree with you. I think that overall, the document is an improvement over the current revision of 800-171. And I believe that a lot of that improvement is because of alignment to 853. And I don't say that just because I am a fan of the way that 853 is written. On a personal basis, I think it's a better document because there is so much information cut out of 853 to form the current version of 800-171 that if you want to know what that requirement is asking you, you have to constantly go back to 853 to remember what that control is asking. There is even a standing DOD policy from 2017 to their contract workforce that says, mm -hmm. if you have questions about 800-171, you've got to go read 853. So let's just cut out the cross-reference time that we're wasting going back and forth and back and forth and just put it all in 800 -171. Now, on that note, something that Ron and I talked about in the podcast is um, the design philosophy of 800 is changing, right? It, doesn't, it isn't just that this resembles more of 800 and that it's moving closer to 800 Ron said on the show, and I'm sure they're going to reiterate this in their webinar on the 6th, Eventually, 800 will just be an 853 overlay. What does that mean? The 853 catalog of controls is designed to be used as a toolbox from which you select controls. Typically, people select the low baseline, the moderate baseline, or the high baseline subset of controls. 
From there, you either sprinkle in some more or you take a couple out in a process known as tailoring. To finish the tailoring process, you have to go through and pick values for all of the blanks in the controls, which we know as organizationally defined parameters or ODPs. That's the big thing that you'll see in the formatting change for 800-171. So you have a whole set of controls in the 853 catalog. You pick some of them, you pick some more or take some out in the tailoring process. You then have all these sets of controls in what is known as an initial baseline. Then you have to fill in all the blanks in your NIST controls, Mad Libs, and pick values for all of these organizationally defined parameters. Once you do that, you've got finished complete controls that have no blanks in them. That is a tailored baseline. It's very similar to the idea of an overlay, which is a selection of controls that are taken from the 853 catalog that then have all of their values defined in them that is usually developed by like a community of interest or some other side project. We'll try to link to some of the few examples they have on the NIST website of overlays that have been selected and tailored from the catalog. Like I said, the design philosophy of NIST now is 800-171 is a CUI protection overlay from 853. And the way that that ought to have been structured all along is take the entire set of controls that are relevant out of 853 and put that set of controls into a standard, that's 800-171. What they tried to do for years was have very, very cut down versions to represent those controls and it caused more problems than it solved. So now we're moving back to 853 formatting. They wanted to, according to Ron Ross, do that all at once, but that would be a big jump to go from sure. just 800 run rev 2 to all 250 some odd controls in 853 word for word, probably too big of a jump, I agree. But um, the reason why I said on the AB Town Hall instead of NDIA, and I'm saying now, if you are in this space and you work with 800-171, CMMC, CUI, get familiar with 853, because that's where we're going. We're going home. We're going back to where it all started. We're going to 853 and Ron Ross is driving the train back to where it all began. So um, so that's the big thing for me in terms of sort of the, the arc of where 171 is going. Now, the ODP thing, let's talk about this. Okay. This has been a big debate on LinkedIn. Probably the main formatting change I think people will notice when they read 853 or 800-171 what month is it? What standard are we talking about? It's when May, they... <laughs> and we're talking about 800-171, revision three. There we go. When you look at the document and you flip through it, you'll notice all of these organizationally defined parameters, these, these blank spots that are in the control. So for instance, the one that people always talk about in the current revision of 800-171, it says, use FIPS validated cryptography to protect the confidentiality of Never heard of classified her. information, right? Well, now that requirement in the draft says, when you protect the confidentiality of CUI using encryption, use blank right. organizationally defined method of cryptography. Now, time out. I don't want to mess up your flow, but sure. organizationally defined, what organization, Jacob? This is the debate. This is the debate because for people who have not experienced the world of 853 and RMF, the organization sounds like your organization. Sounds like you get to pick right. what the variables will be. And that's not always true. It's context dependent. And in this context, we are talking about data for which you are not the data owner. The government is the data owner. And these are the requirements to protect their data and provide them assurance over sure. their data. So if you get to pick all the values, they might not match what the government wants those values to be. So in this context, the organization is the government. There was a question on the AB Town Hall that popped up, and uh, we'll link to the, the LinkedIn poll that we had on this as well. Uh, the question on the Town Hall said, well, when it comes to defining ODPs, uh, we should just look to the title of the document. And it says that this is for non-federal organizations. Therefore, the implementer gets to pick what those values are. That is not true. That is not how yeah. that works. My experience has been, it's always been the issuing organization. So the one yeah. that's issuing the requirements that that, that, that 
that framework is attached right. to it, right? So. And this happens all the time. So like in my time at Northrop Grumman doing weapon systems, ATOs mm -hmm. for various government agencies, um, you get a selection of 853 controls that get picked for this system that need to be implemented and configured. And does Northrop get to pick what the values are going to be? No, because it's not Northrop's system. It's the government's weapon system. So the government has to pick what those values are. And then when the SCA, the security control assessor, shows up to assess and verify those requirements, they are making sure that we implemented and configured everything against the values that the government selected within the controls that they selected, right? Okay. So this raises a big policy question. And for me, more than anything, more than the specifics, because I feel like the controls that were added and merged together and the the detailed changes of 800 -171, again, everyone should go read the document and submit your public comments because it is still a draft, right? So everybody should do that. The bigger picture are the policy questions that 800-171-R3 raises because in the context of the federal CUI program, 800-171 is supposed to represent a minimum baseline of protection for all forms of CUI across the federal government, across all federal agencies, right? And so if you have a standard selection of controls, 110 853 controls, that's great. But there are like 115 or 120 organizationally defined parameters that have not been assigned a value yet. And if every agency and every contractor gets to pick a different value to plug into those controls for all of their different environments, we don't have a minimum baseline, do we? Right? No. So someone needs to define what those values are going to be. In my mind, the people who should be defining those values first should be NARA, the National Archive and Records Administration, because according to the executive order that started the CUI program, they are the CUI program executive agent. They have the conch shell. They have the speaking stick. They are driving the train. They are in charge of the CUI program. And so if, it is, if they're in charge of snapping the minimum baseline, they were contributing authors to the original version of 800 -171, then they get first pass at defining what those minimum values are. Now, are they going to do that? We don't know. Are we going to get a class deviation? We don't know. There's bigger policy questions that get triggered by this draft than the draft can answer. I See, I'm in a weird spot here because there's very often that I disagree with you, okay? But right now, I disagree with you just because my experience doesn't show me that that's a case Fair, that's happened. Yeah. I've never been in a situation well, I mean, where NARA you know, has been the issuing agency, right? Everywhere I come from, it lies on the organization that is issuing whatever requirement that's attached to it. But when you think of it that way, and when you explain it that way, I'm like, shoot, that might be realistic, right? But I don't think that in this case, it's going to come from NARA. I think it's going to be the responsibility of the DOD. Which leads me to two questions that I kind of want to see what your thoughts are on, on, the, on the topic. So with regards to ODPs, could the DOD, I don't know, let's say that there's, do you know off the top of your head exactly how many practices have ODPs attached to them? Uh, I think it's, let me see here. I think it's 65 controls. Some guy I know made like we'll have, a, a sheet, you know. We'll have to, we'll have to double check, double check the math. Everybody should double check. It's just a draft. Like I noticed at all the presentations, again, there's asterisks next to some of these numbers because uh, you can, if you dive into the details, NIST sort of mislabeled a couple things. So based off my initial count, 65 of the requirements in the draft have ODPs. There are 117 ODPs in total. Could the DOD realistically be like 65 controls? Okay. Well, for five of these controls, we want to assert a certain value. Encryption. This is what the standard must be maybe, you know, a couple other ones, like things that are very foundational practices and then punt and give an open ended, yeah. like say, Hey, everything else that's ODP, yeah. you're going to define it. And then add on to that question. Could that ODP be like an organization? Could it say something like an organizationally defined period? So a contractor defined period that is no greater than one year in frequency. So uh, saying yeah, that you I mean, would have I mean, to that's, that's essentially something. defining it with a limit rather than defining yeah. it with a specific value. But yeah, I mean, there's, 
So here's the thing, right? NIST uses ODPs for flexibility, right? right. So just to back up really quick, it Sorry. ought to be NARA that that defines, in a perfect world, NARA would define all the values. They're not going to do that, right? What I think should happen is NARA should pick the core of the controls that they actually care about that actually matter to them. And they say, this is a universal minimum. These are the values. And then it's up to the various agencies. For most of the people listening to the podcast, for everybody that is a DOD contractor, what you really care about is what are DOD's values going to be? So the NARA CUI executive agent thing is like a bigger, more nebulous problem, right? But yes, to your point, DOD does not have to define all the variables, right? They do not have to define all 117. NARA might say, these are the 10 ODPs that we care about. And DOD might say, these are the 30 ODPs that we care about. And the remaining uh, ODPs in the standard, you get to pick whatever you want based off of your risk tolerance. Now, if mm -hmm. I were DOD, if anybody at DOD is listening, that is exactly what I would do. I would probably go to FedRAMP and I would pick the ODP values out of FedRAMP for the controls that I care about. I would use those values. And then I would say all of the undefined ODPs are up to your risk tolerance. And what that would allow DOD to say is we aligned our minimum acceptable values to a long-standing cloud security standard that has been vetted by agencies and some of the best security companies in the world. So these are perfectly justifiable. We're not going off the, you know, off into left field and picking different values. And we're allowing companies to have flexibility and risk-based inputs for all of these values that they get to pick. And I think that's a great way of making the two sides meet without having to do a bunch of new work or lift anything too heavy. Now for contractors, right, who need to get a CMMC certification, this is a sticky situation because let's say 57 of the, uh, or let's go 67 of the 117 ODPs, more than half of the draft ODPs are up mm -hmm. to you to define. When your CMMC assessor shows up, they are not looking to make sure that you defined those ODPs against what the DOD is expecting. You're telling them what the ODP is that you picked. So if you specified the ODP in a control, and then they look at the evidence that that control is implemented, and it doesn't match the number you picked, you only have yourself to blame for that control not being implemented because you got to pick the value. Right. You know what the test questions are in 800-171A. You know what the answer is because you picked the ODP. And so if you miss that control, then um, that's that's not a DOD problem, right? So, I mean, that's a, that's a weird situation because as we've seen over the years, people don't like doing that. Everybody says we want a risk-informed or a very flexible risk-based approach to the controls. Here, we're going to have probably many, many ODPs that are a value that you get to pick, right? It's up to you to decide what is okay and acceptable and good security. There's no compliance here. You're complying with your own decision, essentially. Right. Nobody's telling you what the values ought to be. So when somebody shows up to verify that that's true, that's going to be a difficult conversation because what happens if you miss your CMMC certification because you didn't implement controls that you got to define, right? So it's it's good and bad. We're we're taking the arm floaties off by not defining the ODPs, but we're swimming in the deep end because you get to pick the ODPs. So there's there's trade offs here. You don't get told specifically what to do, but you get to kind of pick what you want to do, and that that has its own benefits and drawbacks. So one of the things to look at with, with the ODPs, especially if uh, the contracting organization um, gets to define the values, is it's a way to manage workloads, right? For the people that have to carry out the procedures, um, you know, like obviously if the DOD defines something, then you have to make sure that you have enough people to carry out whatever that task may be at that defined frequency. Um, however, if they get to define it, then they know what the constraints is that they have on resources and they can pl place less of a burden 
on their resources to perform these tasks, just making sure that they're getting done. So yeah. um, I, obviously, you know, depending on how you look at it, potato, potato, both of them taste good. Well, you know, here's the, here's the thing is, you know, a lot of people who have to get a CMMC certification because they have to implement 8171 according to DOD DFARS contract requirements, get information that has ITAR requirements attached to it. And so when 853 describes ODPs, they say, listen, if you have external regulatory requirements, those are going to dictate what the values in your ODPs are going to be. So it isn't just that we have DOD maybe determining what the ODPs are. We've also got Department of State for a lot of DOD contractors that will be defining what those ODPs are. This is a reason why, right? It's probably good for NARA to define as many as possible because then it leaves this, you know, mom and dad situation of a bunch of different people all trying to decide what we're going to do here from getting out of hand. Now, I don't know how it's going to play out, but ODPs are a concept that people should be familiar with. They're definitely something that people should look at inside of the controls. Theoretically, theoretically, if you've already implemented 8171, then this isn't going to be a surprise to you because you had to define or select or document or somehow indicate what those values are according to 8171A, right? Mm -hmm. So this brings up the topic of how much of a delta is the draft above 8171, and that's a difficult question to answer because they've added about 27 new controls, uh, which is, you know, a lot of new controls, but they've also added a bunch of lines of things to do for existing controls. If you've already fully implemented the existing control, then those new lines for existing controls aren't really new because they're really more reflective of what was in 800.171a. And if you did 800.171a, you had to define a lot of ODPs, even though you didn't know that's what they were being called at the time. Another reason why going back to 853 formatting is better because we don't have to do this game of comparing what 800 calls it versus what 853 calls it. And you and I get up here every month and go, actually, did you know that 853 has been doing this all along? E either way, right? Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's back just, in my day, eight hundred. I'm really happy that they're going the back to the formatting, so we don't have to constantly go back and forth between the two documents, right? Yeah. So it's like you and you read a single line requirement in eight hundred one seventy one, and then eight hundred one seventy one A's first uh, question for every single document is define, 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 define. Then you should probably just say in the original control, ODP, ODP, ODP needs to be defined. That way, it's not a giant surprise whenever people open up 800.171a and they get a different set of questions. They should match. They should be published at the same time, which hopefully is what they're going to end up doing. So ODPs are very important for people to uh, take in mind. They're not going away. That formatting is definitely going to stick around. And then one of the things that we haven't talked about um, in this conversation about the draft, uh, the Rev3 draft, um, is obviously the addition and reincorporation of either some old friends or some much needed friends into the requirements, right? So what I mean by that, I saw you blink. It's cool. Um, bear with me. Okay. I'm not going off the deep end. That's not a, uh, that's not a, that's not a physiological indicator of annoyance. It's just because I haven't slept a lot. What month is it? It's May. Yeah. Again. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're in May, buddy. It's, it's grilling season. <laughs> um, so usually from people like me, it's the good weather so I can go out and play golf finally. Right. But you live in California, play all the time. Like I'm squandering the good weather, man. I have not been outside in a, a minute. Um, so with that being said, the addition of the three new control families. So we went from 14 to 17, right? We yeah. popped in planning, obviously needed planning. Planning contains all the documentation, kind of governance stuff, um, associated with the, the CMMC process. Um, systems and service acquisition. So things to do with things that you purchase, things that you buy, contracts that you have, and then supply chain risk management. Obviously, those are exciting. But what's contained in that and what's included or some of the new controls that are included really has semblances. And you said this last night on, on the, or, sorry, as of this recording, last night's town. Yeah, hall. which we'll make sure that we link to that video that way if everybody wants to see some of the details of the breakdown of 171R3, definitely watch that video. And then when we were at NDIA New England, and obviously the news broke that the draft came out, um, I saw you at the event that morning, and we saw our boss, Scott Edwards, at the event. And the first thing that came out of a couple of our mouths was, 
wow, the ghost of the Delta 20 has has arisen, right? Man, what a man, what a <laughs> it what all a comes story. full circle, Jacob. All right, so I gotta make this chart. I've been telling people I gotta make this chart, I gotta make this chart. I'm gonna make this chart as soon as this is done. If everybody thinks back to CMMC, write that on, hold on, write that on your notepad underneath yeah, CCA. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know. It actually came up in the town hall last night as one of the questions that got asked. Uh, Matt asked, "Hey, how does the 171 R3 draft compare to CMMC 1.0?" Crazy story, right? One of the main things that everybody used to gripe about with 171 R2 was the NFO controls, the assumptions about what contractors had in place. And one of the biggest assumptions about what was in place was that all contractors had well-documented information security programs. They had policies and procedures that governed the technical functionality going on in their environments. As it turns out, that's mostly not true. Most companies do not have well-documented uh, policies and procedures. They have very poor governance over their security programs. And so the problem is, is that when you go to assess and verify that a control is implemented, you have to figure out what that technical functionality is actually enforcing. You have to figure mm -hmm. out what that configuration is trying to do. And typically that means you have to define what it's trying to do. You have to- Define where? Yeah, exactly. And so it has to be documented somewhere, typically in your policies and procedures. So you couldn't pass an assessment to verify that the controls were implemented if you didn't have policies and procedures, but policies and procedures weren't an explicit requirement. They were an assumption. And all the way back in the day, under CMMC 1.0, people might remember that we had something called process maturity. And if you look back at the assessment procedures for process maturity, and you look at the assessment procedures for policies and procedures in 853A, you might notice that they are exactly the same because DOD did what seemingly every federal agency loves to do most. They took 853 controls and then they called them something new because who knows why, but under the hood, it was all 853. So now the biggest amount of new controls that are added to the 800 draft baseline are 16 policy and procedure controls that are all encompassed under a single new requirement that says you have to have policies and procedures. But if process maturity under CMMC 1.0 was policies and procedures, and the new requirement in 800-171-R3 is policies and procedures, did we actually do anything different than what we were trying to do under CMMC 1.0? Not at all. We're right back where we started. Well, hold on. Hold on. If I remember correct, and this was a long time ago, so let me just you know knock off the cobwebs on that part of my brain, but there was more to the process of evaluating policies and procedures, not just that they exist, right, and that you have them, but evaluating the quality of them. What well, they so this was this was out. the this was the X factor under CMMC 1.0 that came from a lot of influence of CMMI people who were in charge of the original CMMC 1.0 project, where mm -hmm. They would say, yeah, these are the procedures that we should use to verify that your policies and procedures are in place. But then there's also going to be some subjective judgment by your assessor to determine if they are worthy of actually being mature. And we're not going to write down what that means. We're not going to tell you what that means. We're not going to give you an example. We'll just know it when we see it. And understandably, they really piss people off because you're saying, here's your requirements for how your policies and standards should be structured. Here's how sure. you know if you have them in place and here's how they relate to the rest of the controls. And there's going to be some other thing that we can't tell you about that the entire thing is hinging on. They were correct to get rid of that X factor maturity part. Well, the extra the it, bonus is, is that a third party is going to come in and it's going to be based on their belief that you have established this, right? right? And so this was this so, was very this was very subjective, right? <clears throat> if you've got standard evaluation criteria in 853A for what a policy and procedure needs to look like, that should be good enough. Because mm -hmm. if all your ODPs are defined properly and you're good to go with all of your external regulations, <clears throat> then as long as your policies and procedures meet the assessment uh, criteria. In 53A, it should be good. There doesn't have to be anything extra added to that. You can make recommendations. There's best practices. 
but that but it shouldn't fail anybody because of this undefinable factor outside of it and that's good that's good so we've we've effectively taken the best part of cmmc 1.0 policy and procedure evaluation and kept it in the uh undoing of nfo controls around policies and procedures in 800-171 rev 3 without any of the nonsense cmmc 1.0 maturity evaluation thing that nobody could actually describe or define anywhere where in 853 is that written down where in 853 do i evaluate maturity does anybody know right there's no there's nothing to point to so it's very very difficult to structure a cmmc program around that concept which is why cmmc 2.0 doesn't have it right that's yep. why they aligned to the NIST standards. Either way, the 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 big picture is is that we're essentially taking a lot of the requirements that CMMC 1.0 added on top of 8171, but then everybody got very upset and got rid of them, and we've added them back in through the NIST channel now instead. Just written so, slightly better. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so it's I, it's one of those things where it's like, man, we spent a really long time reviewing the program and waiting around and waiting for CMMC to go to CMMC 2.0 just to end up with the exact same controls that DOD wanted back in 2020. So, you know, if, just a if you were walking yeah. in Gladiator, so if you were in the Joaquin Phoenix role in Gladiator, bear with me here, and NIST 800-171 Rev 3 draft was on the ground about to meet its demise, would you thumb up or thumb down? Um, That's thumb the impression. Means, thumb up means you get to make it, right? Thumb, thumb up means, thumb, thumb up means it lives. Thumbs down 100%. means it's... Yeah. 100% yeah. thumbs up, One, I agree. Rev 3 gets to live. 100%. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've got the... Uh, well, we've got the link to the AB Town Hall where I go over the slides that describe the changes for 800-171 Rev 3. I would tell people that the last section of those slides, as of this recording, is probably um, my favorite part of analysis. We're going to have a lot more content and details coming up in the coming days and weeks on 800 Rev 3. But there's a series of four tables there that drive home sort of one overarching point. One of the main points of confusion that we're sort of seeing emerge around 171 R3 is people go, well, should I do anything at all? until 800-171 Rev 3 is done? And yes, the answer is, yeah, you should 100% be implementing 800-171 R2. The only real caveat is FIPS encryption, which most people don't have implemented at this point. But the overwhelming majority of the standard is exactly the same. 75% of the controls are identical, effectively, especially if you look at them in comparison with 800-171-A. So the contents of 800-171 have expanded dramatically, but the overall set of requirements in comparison to 171-A are not really all that different for the vast majority of the catalog. Another reason why it's very important for NIST to get 171-A's revision out as soon as possible so that we can draw the line between the two. So um, those charts will show you, and I've got the list of examples below those charts as well that say, hey, when you are going to submit your public comments on the standard, these are the controls that you probably will want to look at first. For instance, um, there were some controls that were categorized as NCO in 800-171-R2, so not related to the confidentiality of CUI, not a requirement in 800-171 but are now in 800-171-R3 draft. So they weren't relevant to confidentiality for seven years, and now they suddenly are relevant to confidentiality in the Rev3 draft. So these were, um, let's see, uh, AC23, uh, disabling accounts, AU11, audit record retention, and SI8, spam protection. So that is a perfectly good debate to have with NIST. Be like, hey, everybody. Hey, Ron. You said that these weren't related to confidentiality for seven years. What's up? Like, why did that change? What was the justification? I don't agree with you. Or I do agree with you. And I think this was a good change. That is a very good constructive comment that affects the 
tangible material impact of of 800-171 on people who have to implement them, right? Sure. And so the 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 point of those charts being if you read 800-171 and you think, "Hey, this is too much stuff." Submitting the comment this is too much overall doesn't really give NIST anything to sink their teeth into. If you dig into the tailoring of 853 and how it is reflected in the 800-171 draft, you can say things like I don't think this is related to confidentiality because blah, 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 therefore take it out. Or mm -hmm. I think your assumption that uh, contractors have such and such in place is not correct. You need to tailor it into the baseline. Or there were a couple of controls that were related to CUI that are now labeled as no longer being related to CUI. One of them being the maintenance control 3.7.1. So you might say, hey, that's still related, put it back. Or you might say, hey, you're right, that's not related, take it out. And while you're at it, take out the rest of the maintenance requirements too, because the tailoring that NIST goes through is what is really going to dictate what eventually ends up in the draft or not. So uh, just on that note, right, there's a couple that went like they were already in the requirements and then they got shifted out, but there's not very many. The, the lion's share of the controls that people should pay attention to are controls that were NFO that are now relevant to CUI in the baseline. This was the majority of the new additions. This was things like policies and procedures. Do you think that policies and procedures should be an explicit requirement? If you remember from previous episodes, the pre-draft public comments to NIST overwhelmingly said, get rid of FIPS encryption, include policies and procedures. They got mm -hmm. rid of FIPS encryption for now until somebody defines it as a requirement. And they brought back policies and procedures. But some of the other things that used to be NFO controls that are now in the baseline are things like independent assessment, setting up information exchanges and trust agreements, setting up and monitoring uh, internal system connections, high risk area configurations, testing your information, uh, your incident response plan, uh, setting up and defining rules of behavior and acceptable use policies on your systems. Uh, external personnel security policies for people who work at your external service providers, mm -hmm. uh, your frequency and details of your vulnerability scanning, your external system services and your agreements and SLAs with your managed service providers and folks like that, and minimizing system access points. Those were all things that NIST assumed that contractors were doing. It made it very difficult to assess the requirements when those weren't actually in place. So now they have made them explicit requirements. Do you agree that those should be explicit requirements? Should they still be assumptions? Should they be in the baseline at all? The slide that we presented on the town hall towards the end has that list. I would tell people, go read those and say, do you agree? Rather than just saying the whole thing is too much or the whole thing is too expensive. No, I, all the changes, it's well thought out. It's well played. And it gets rid of the major assumptions that we know should have been added from the get-go, right? That, that should yeah, have been I part of any... The, I think the NFO assumptions being tailored into the baseline are probably going to be a tough fight uh, with NIST. But there's two other categories of controls that are added to the baseline that come from 853 tailoring. One is the set of controls that were already in 853 Rev4, but were not in the moderate baseline. Mm -hmm. That when we went to 853 Rev5, they were added to the moderate baseline. So already in 853, not in the baseline, therefore not in 800-171. They added controls to the baseline in 853 Rev5 and said they are relevant to CUI. That should set off alarm bells in everybody's mind because you said, whoa, 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 whoa. You already had these controls in 853 Rev4 for years. And you had the moderate baseline in 853 Rev4 derived down to 800-171 for years. And now all of a sudden we've got one, two, three, four, 12 of those controls are suddenly relevant to CUI. Why? Why are they relevant? 
And, and so the spreadsheet that NIST provides you on their website, their change analysis spreadsheet, very, very good. Everyone can read it for a high level list of the things that are included, but the far right column only tells you aligned to 853. Why was it aligned to 853? Do you agree that they should be uh, relevant to CUI? I would say that that list of 12 requirements of controls that were upgraded to the moderate baseline are prime candidates for you to be like, I don't think that those should be in the baseline. I don't think that those are relevant to CUI. Either one of those will get them taken from the baseline. Examples of this, uh, stuff like uh, enhancements to lease privilege, enhancements to inactivity logout parameters, um, control verification and impact analysis enhancements, uh, managing user status, uh, preventing unauthorized removal of equipment, um, dealing with unsupported components. Now, I don't think that from a security perspective, it's good to get rid of those things. I think that those enhancements are all justified. I think you can make a very strong case for them. But, but they used to be in the catalog and they weren't in the baseline and they weren't designated as being relevant to CUI. So we've had to make several logical jumps to have them end up in the draft so if you're looking for places to minimize the number of requirements, I would look at that list of 12 things. Uh, slide, uh, this would be slide 30, between 30 and 40 on the AB Town Hall presentation that we'll link to everybody. And then just the, yep. last, the last grouping are the new controls in 853 Rev 5 that were never in the 853 catalog before that were then included in the moderate baseline and that were then labeled as relevant to CUI. There's 12 of those, six of those being the supply chain risk management controls, right? You said, hey, you know, you added a bunch of new stuff in 853 Rev 5 related to supply chain risk management and it got added to the moderate baseline and it's now suddenly relevant to CUI. Do you think it's relevant to CUI? Do you think it should be in the moderate baseline? If you have issues with either of those, then that's the kind of comment that you should to submit to NIST rather than saying supply chain risk management is expensive, right? Like it's not that it's not expensive. It's not that that's not a valid thing to say. It's just that it doesn't give NIST something to work on in a language that they can understand, if that makes sense, or a language that they can action on. Yeah, it fully makes sense. Um obviously, you know, we always talk about how important it is the way you deliver the message and then and the way that you put things into a format that everybody can understand it and they can act on it. And so like, I, I believe that this is the first of many steps that are going to take place that it's going to get to a point where it's going to be like fully comprehensive. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, like I said, we're going to link to the town hall video that talks about it. We're going to have a lot more content that comes out on it. Ultimately, at this point, People should read the document, they should read the supplemental materials that NIST provided, and they should submit their public comments as priority number one, and do not be paralyzed by the new formatting in 171R3 that would prevent you from implementing your current requirements in 800-171R2. Most of the requirements are the same. Most of the new requirements are just enhancements to those existing requirements, so they necessarily have to come second anyways. There were three other things that happened this month that we were going to go over very quickly. One okay. was uh, from ND ISAC, from the National Defense ISAC, uh, and friend of the show, Allison Giddens. They have published a small business handbook that talks about supply chain risk management, relevant to many of the new controls in 853. However, I think this was mostly coincidence. I don't think that this was actually coordinated. We'll link to that. It's very, very good. Allison Giddens president and CEO of WinTech Solutions, an actual defense contracting small business machine shop manufacturer. This supply chain risk management handbook is written in a language of manufacturers of small businesses. It's a very good read. Uh, it's good all around. I recommend everybody check it out and we'll have a link to it in the comments. Or in yeah. The, the only, the only thing that is worse than, you know, or excuse me, not worse. Um, it's nice to have guidance, right? But it's terrible when the guidance, once we just said it, is not ingestible. And this is an ingestible format that's written by manufacturers, basically uh, by manufacturers and small business owners for manufacturers and small business yeah. owners. So yeah, I think um, it's a great resource. Um, yes. Yeah, people should definitely check it out. All right. So uh, one of the other things that happened, I cannot believe that this is a footnote towards the end of the show. 
the DOD issued a proposed rule for the DIB CS program, the DIB cybersecurity program. And the purpose of this rule is to expand eligibility to all contractors that have DFARS 7012 to be able to participate in the DIB cybersecurity program, which primarily is a threat intel information sharing uh, program that keeps people up to date with threat advisories, provides uh, indicators of compromise, and is essentially this large program that companies participate in to work towards better security that previously was only available to cleared defense contractors for years and years. Uh, this is an effort by DOD to make resources more available to the DIB to facilitate their security. And in order to do that, they have to publish a rule, they have to take public comments, and then the rule has to go final. Um, so that actually came out. That rule is still going, and people can submit their public comments until June 20th of 2023. And so the DIBCS rule, um, right now, the DIBCS program is, I think it's in the thousands, but this rule it potentially expands the eligible organizations by tenfold. And, Absolutely. And, um, Anybody now there that are, has a DFAR 7012 clause in their contract would be able to participate. And if you can fully leverage the benefits of the program, the threat intelligence sharing, the community, you know, um, comments and, and back and forth, and then obviously any of the solutions that are offered, um, then you should obviously take advantage of them. Um, just make sure that you fully understand what you're taking advantage of and what it means for you when it goes into yeah. it. Yeah, I think that there's, uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, next month how many comments actually come in. As of the time of this recording, there are two. There are two public comments, and the Federal Register webpage keeps account of the number of page views for every rule that gets published. And currently, the count is somewhere around 1,100, and that is 99% fewer page views than the rule for the 2020 CMMC rule currently has. So um, it's a good program. Their resources are good. People should definitely check it out when they expand eligibility, but it's a voluntary program that people don't have to participate in. And I think that is reflected in the amount of attention that the rule is getting. This is what we mentioned at the top of the show. DOD made a LinkedIn post reminding people that this even happened. And uh, I think it's just something that people should uh, ponder that when you had a mandatory program come out as a rule, it was the most viewed DOD rule of all time. And here you have something that is good for security, that is a well-established good program that is completely voluntary and not mandatory, and nobody even knows that it's happening, which is why we're talking about it. Yeah, I think that the more people that are exposed to the benefits that the program has to offer, and the uh, more people that are made aware uh, that the program exists and they're eligible for it, um, will be more organizations that are better off in the long run. Yeah. All right. So the last thing that we were going to talk about, Volt Typhoon. Hmm. So uh, interesting um, name. Yeah. So there is um, there is probably no better way to wrap up this episode after all of this constant detailed arguing about security controls and baselines and things that ultimately feel just like compliance nonsense to a lot of people than talking about actual, real deal, advanced persistent threat, Chinese nation state adversaries that conducted campaigns on Guam against American critical infrastructure that the US Navy confirmed affected naval assets in Guam, clearly as a geopolitical strategic move to set up the inevitable issues coming down over the island of Taiwan. That is a very big picture geopolitical issue. And so CISA and the Five Eyes and everybody issued this joint advisory, Microsoft issued one as well, that said the Volt Typhoon um, APT group is conducting the following activity. Everyone should read the guidance because if you want to see what the front lines of the cyber war look like, the details contained in that advisory will show you this is what it looks like. This is what they're doing. This is how it works. Now, I took issue with the advisory because the advisory stops one step short of doing what would be most valuable, in my opinion, is connecting that activity to security controls that help to mitigate that activity. Mm -hmm. Now, these are advanced persistent threats. These are 
nation state actors. So your ability to stop them completely is not guaranteed, right? But security controls don't just focus on prevention anymore, right? We don't live in that world anymore. Security controls focus on detection or recovery response. or yep. response or all kinds of different stuff, including mitigation and prevention to some degree. And so I went to a project that MITRE used to maintain in the MITRE Ingenuity Office, where they used to map the MITRE attack framework to 853. MITRE attack is a database of actual real world documented cybersecurity bad guy techniques that lists them under categories. And they said, hey, it sure would be cool if we connected the dots between real world stuff that actual real world cyber bad guys do to security controls. What a concept, right? That there might be a connection between these two things. But MITRE doesn't maintain that project anymore, unfortunately. It's a couple versions back. So anyways, I decided um, to go through and just do a quick analysis. And it turns out that many of the controls that MITRE identifies as helping to deal with this activity, actual APT activity, not stop it in its tracks, but help, are the same 853 controls that are contained in 800 hmm. right? And so this is not to sort of like dunk on the on CISA or NSA or anybody. It's just saying that it would make the advisories a lot more usable if they also included that information on top of it, because the details that are in that advisory make the controls actionable. But if you only give people controls or you only give people details, then you're missing the two sides of the coin that you need in order to try to deal with what's going on. So we went through and looked, and uh, I think this is the first time that we've talked about this analysis anywhere is at the end of the show, but out of the top 10 most common controls identified by MITRE that map from MITRE attack techniques to 853, nine of them are in 800-171, and eight of those nine have been requirements since all the way back in the 2013 baseline. So when we're talking about draft revisions, when we're talking about changes to 853, when we're talking about all this stuff, it doesn't really change the fundamentals under the hood all that much. Same controls for the last 10 years are the same controls that pop up as actually helping with real world activity going on in the world right now. Yeah, so it's the same like element as if uh, we and we take and we do this all the time when when CISA issues threat advisories and alerts, um, we map the remediation strategies to mm -hmm. controls, right? And, and what you see is you see this continuous trend of not only has it been existent for a really really long time, sometimes for a decade or, or greater, um, but it's repetitive with every single event where the characteristics are present that it's repetitive. And if you go through and you look at it. Um, and just looking at this list that you've curated, which we'll put obviously in the notes, yeah. um, it's also eerily similar to the uh, the recommendations and the control mappings for the threat advisories and all the events that happen that spurn these threat advisories, right? Yeah, we'll because we only the get these advisories that, yeah. when people are doing things, when we right. have TTPs and stuff associated with them. So it's just crazy. Like I I've said this multiple times. I've said it to you multiple times. You've said it multiple times. How many times and how many different ways is it being said? What is the missing link that is stopping it from being ingested and acted on? Yeah, it's. I think that this would help a lot. I don't know if it's the silver bullet that would fix implementation across the board. I think there's a lot of things that need to happen, but I think this is an easy connection to make. MITRE proved the concept back um, you know, a while ago with previous versions of MITRE attack, but if nobody uses it, then they're not gonna maintain the project. So I'd like to bring some attention Hopefully they can start that project over again. We'll put the text of those top 10 controls in the description until we get more content going on about it. If anybody's curious, the number one most common control that MITRE identified as helping to deal with MITRE attack techniques, real world techniques shown by APT actors, the 853 control SI4, which in 800-171 shows up as 3.14.6 system monitoring. So everybody go read SI4, go read 3.14.6 and go read the Volt Typhoon advisory and try to see how those two things are connected because connecting those two dots are what actually make security and compliance two sides of the same coin 
rather than this constant false debate that we're having with each other. Anyways, that was the month of May. We got the a month rule. of May. You, get it. you re- did it. You did it. <laughs> we did you it. We did it. We got a new rule. We got a new revision. We got a major APT threat advisory. We had a town hall that we were on. Uh, we had all kinds of stuff happen, and we didn't get to a bunch of the other details. We had an interview on. with Ron Ross. Like- we talked to Ron Ross. I mean, it was a it was a crazy month. We've got lots of content that we're going to link to everybody, and plenty of other stuff that we're going to dive deeper into in the month of June once we all have more time to look at this stuff in detail. But what a until month! Until then, huh? yeah. Until then, we'll see you next month, right? Yep. See ya. See ya. Thank you.